Now, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Daniel Nenny. So, this Daniel Nenny, uh, which gave a, a keynote speech, is a founder of the Semi Wiki blog and is co author and author of several books. And you will find uh, at the back of the, this room some, uh, some books uh, he wrote. And Daniel is also internationally recognized as a business developer for companies, especially with the fabless uh, semiconductor ecosystem. So, Daniel, please, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you for coming and, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is semiconductors past, present, and future. Uh, what this means to me is that it's really important that you understand how you got to where you are today before you can really decide where you're going tomorrow. So that's the theme of this presentation. First, I'll tell you quickly how I got to where I am today. Um, I was at the university in my undergraduate uh, studying computer science, programming away very happily, and I read this book. Uh, it's Soul of a New Machine by Tracy Kidder. It's actually a Pulitzer Prize winning book. I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with it but it documents the development of a 32-bit mini-computer inside a much larger company. Uh, so it's a, it's a startup inside of a company, and um, this book did several things for me. One is it made me really curious about what was inside the computer that was hidden in a back room at, at the university, because we were sitting at dumb terminals. And uh, as my wife will tell you, uh, curiosity is my superpower. I'm, I'm one of the guys that takes things apart because I'm so curious. So I really wanted to know what was inside these computers uh, down to the semiconductor level, and, and that's how I got into semiconductors. Uh, it also gave me the, the thirst for startup companies, and I have, that is what I focused on throughout my career. Uh, it's very exciting, especially in this industry. Um, it also provided me with my first job, because I actually did go to work for Data General, the company that the, the book is about. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember back then, but um, Computer systems companies dominated the semiconductor industry. They had their own fabs. You know, not only did they design their own semiconductors, they manufactured them, and uh, Data General was one of those. Uh, they had a fab in Silicon Valley, so that's where I started my career. Data General also offered me the opportunity to go and work with their customers. And it was really an amazing thing. Uh, one of the customers was Perkin Elmer, and they did their eBeam machines based on data general computers. If you looked at all the machines in the semiconductor industry, all the computing power, quite a bit of it was data general. So I'm, I'm right out of college, and I get to see these eBeam machines, and they were just so complex and so amazing. It was astonishing. Uh, the other company that I worked with was GE Kalma, and they had the IC design station, based on data general computers. So I worked with GE Kalma. That was really my introduction into EDA because I also worked with other companies that did EDA software, so Meta Software, Spice, uh, DRC was, was very popular on data general. And uh, as part of my training, data general sent me to the design automation conference. Right out of college, they sent me to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, for those of you who remember back then, it was a pretty wild time. So going from college to DAC in 1984 wasn't a big transition. There was a lot of partying, a lot of excitement. Uh, we've matured as an industry, but I really have a high pre appreciation for DAC and, and what, what it's done for the industry. Uh, I spent 10 years in the computer industry uh, with the semiconductor uh, market segment, and then I went to uh, Zycad uh, as an EDA company. So Zycad wasn't a startup. Uh, they were already public, and they were very famous for their accelerator boards and their emulation boards, and they used FPGAs. Uh, and there was somebody inside uh, Zycad that said, we can develop a better FPGA. And so this was the type of startup that uh, I read about at Data General, a startup within a company, and, and I jumped on it. Uh, FPGAs are very difficult. Uh, you might not know the name Gatefield, but uh, they were bought by Actel, and Actel was bought by Microsemi, and the Gatefield people, some of them are still at Microsemi. That architecture is still in play. It, it's definitely a, a big win for uh, Gatefield. Uh, then I went to EDA, Avante, you all know, place and route, uh, very big, very exciting market back then. Uh, DRC, we also got into, so I spent a lot of time at DRC. Uh, prolific, and Avante was bought by Synopsys. 
Uh, Prolific was uh, an IP company, my first introduction to IP, and it did two things. It, it made me appreciate how important IP is in the industry, and this was, you know, 20 years ago or so, and I, I could see how important IP was, the building blocks, and uh, how it enabled design. I also understood how important the foundries were because as a standard cell company, you had to have a relationship with the foundries, and that's what I did. I, I had to work with the foundries, and I traveled all over the world. Um, from Prolific uh, Virage, another IP company, Virage was unique because they're SRAM, and all of processes and, and companies f design SRAM first. So at Virage, I was the foundry guy, so I worked with the foundries, but I also got to see what the view of the future was, because all of our uh, uh, memories were in the processes and the first runs and then the the big customers so Virage of course was bought by Synopsys and then I became a, a private consultant for uh, small companies to help them with their foundry relationships and Salido was one of my first clients I still work with Salido after eight years uh, Berkeley Design Automation was a client for several years they were purchased by Mentor um, Tanner EDA was a client they were purchased by Mentor and so on and so on so that's just briefly uh, how I got to where I am today. But what you'll find is that uh, the EDA uh, industry has evolved in a similar manner. Um, you know, how do you look at history? History is so important. Um, you can read books. I mean, that's the traditional way to understand history. Another good opportunity is to write a book. So this is a book that Paul McClellan and I wrote. It was published in 2012. Uh, there's over, over 150,000 copies of this book in circulation now. It's somewhat of a bestseller in, in our industry by industry standards. Um, what we did was, we, what I did was I really wanted to write a book about TSMC. But TSMC said, you know, let's focus on the ecosystem, let's focus on the industry. And so this is the, the book that came about. Uh, we started at the transistor, we talked about the ASIC business, uh, we profiled specific companies. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting stories that came out of this is, we talked to some of the founders of the fabulous companies that started this whole uh, transformation. And they said in their business plans, they actually had to put fabs. So they had to tell the VCs that they were actually going to build fabs because you couldn't be a semiconductor company back then without a fab. Of course, they never had uh, the, the, the desire to build a fab, but that's how they got money. Uh, Xilinx, by the way, is, is one of those companies. Um, and then we talk about the foundries and EDA and IP and I think the, the most interesting chapter was chapter eight, which I asked the CEOs of all these companies, more than 20 CEOs, you know, what's next? You know, we have SOCs, this was uh, uh, 2012, you know, what's coming next? And they all gave us paragraphs and it's interesting to go back and read these, you know, years later to see what the CEOs thought would be coming. And, and you'll see that IOT was mentioned uh, quite a few times, so there was some, some uh, good vision there. The, the other thing uh, I use for historical reference and to, to understand, uh, you know, the, the, the evolution of companies and industries are wikis. Um, I'm a big wiki fan. Uh, that's why SemiWiki is named SemiWiki. Wikis are a big part of our, our website. Um, this is actually one of the wikis. It's um, EDA mergers and acquisitions. Somebody in the crowd kept track of all the EDA mergers that were done over the years. And so we created this wiki in 2011. It's a, it's a living document. Um, more than uh, 84,000 people have read this, which is, is quite a few people uh, if you look at the industry. Um, so if you want to know how Synopsys became who they are today, you can actually see step by step all the acquisitions. And it, it's quite interesting because uh, the more acquisitions companies did, the more successful they were, you know, and, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, on this wiki. You know, more importantly, now we have digital media, and uh, this is what happened to me. I started writing. Um, one of the drawbacks I felt in this industry was that we didn't get a fair, a fair shake in the press. So we didn't get a lot of press. You know, this was 10 to 20 years ago. And even when we got press, it wasn't that good. Um, so I started writing, and I started a blog on uh, WordPress, and it was about foundries. So that's what I did, that's what I knew. I started writing about foundries. Uh, really back then, this was in 2009, people weren't writing about the foundries. Uh, TSMC was not a very well-known uh, well company. So uh, I started this WordPress blog, and I remember telling my wife, okay, I'm gonna do this for a year and, and see how it goes. And, and at the end of the year, thousands of people were reading my blog. It was very humbling, because I could see some of the people that registered for it, but I really couldn't see much else, because it was WordPress. So uh, what I did was I created SemiWiki, and it's a 
a relational database. It's MySQL. It's, uh, it's not your usual media website uh, because we wanted to understand everything that went along with, with the readership. Uh, I also recruited other bloggers. So uh, Paul McClellan and Daniel Payne, they were well-established EDA bloggers. They came to SemiWiki. And then I convinced other professionals that they should start blogging. Not as easy as it might sound, but one of our other first bloggers is Erica Steve, very well known IP expert. He first started blogging on SemiWiki. So there were four of us and we started blogging and now there's more than 12. Uh, we have a lot of industry experts now who are well known based on their blogging. Scott Jones uh, is, a, is one of them, Tom Dillinger, just semiconductor professionals that also like to write. So this is what I really want to show you, and this is the analytics behind SemiWiki, and this isn't really history, but it's hindsight, right? And hindsight is 2020. This is, you know, a 24-hour a, a uh, feedback loop. Um, we can see what goes on in the website, and some of the things are quite interesting. Um, the total number of users, that's actually devices, not, not people, but as you'll see, that actually is pretty close to how many people we have. Uh, the interesting thing is domains, 85,000. You know, if you look at the content on SemiWiki, the only people that are reading it are people that are designing semiconductors, because that's all we write about. And so 85,000, and, and what's interesting is our domain count was pretty slow climbing. It was the usual suspects, the, the IC design guys, until we started talking about IoT. And that was in 2014, and then things exploded. And it wasn't just the IC companies, it was systems companies and companies all over the world. Uh, a lot of them I, I recognized, a lot of them I didn't. And I had to go and look and, and see, and they were just doing some quite, quite interesting things. Uh, we know where the traffic comes from. Uh, search has always dominated our site, and that's good because if you're looking at search results, these are people that are actually looking for answers to a certain question or trying to solve a problem. So our site is developed for search. Uh, I think it's the most interesting traffic there is. Uh, we also get keywords to find out what they search. You have to be careful what you, you write because you, you wanna make sure that the proper keywords are getting people, but um, search traffic is very interesting. Uh, this is the geographic uh, locations. Um, Probably not, not too surprising, uh, France is number six, so that, that's been trending up. Uh, you know, if, if uh, number one actually is Russia, but uh, that's including hacking attempts, so <laughs> no offense, just a joke. Um, so anyway, that, that's the traffic, and, and that's been pretty consistent. But it's interesting to see, you know, what people read uh, from the different areas. Um, as I said, Google knows so much about you, uh, you probably don't want to know, but let me tell you anyway. Uh, so desktop versus mobile, the interesting thing here is that the majority of the traffic for the internet is mobile. It's anybody's site, it's 60%, 70%, 80% mobile, but not semi-wiki. And the reason is they're, do they're looking at work, right? Search, they're working, they're on PCs or laptops, and that makes it interesting because then we see the domains. If they're on their mobile, we don't necessarily see your domain. It says AT&T or Verizon, right? So this is the most interesting traffic. Uh, we know what devices you're on down to the model number. Uh, you know, the semiconductor industry guys, you would think we would be on the latest and greatest. Not so much. A lot of iPhone 4s, to be honest with you. Uh, and you would think more uh, Android than Apple, but not, not the case. Uh, we, we, we mostly use Apple. So browser, OS, we know your screen resolution. I, I don't know why, but... Maybe some people were interested. So the age distribution, I think this is interesting. Of course, you, you do know that Google knows how old you are. Uh, I think this is quite accurate. The interesting thing here is we've been trending down. So um, when we first started, we were uh, dominated by 45 to 54 year olds. You know, judging by this room, that you know that's probably probably the case. But if you look now, it's it's trending down, and you know I expect this to continue which is nice because there's younger people coming into our industry and that's not always been the case. But you also have to realize these people communicate differently. So that's something you need to take in consideration. Fortunately, I have four children of this age group, so I'm constantly reminded how they communicate. Gender, yeah, they know if we're male or female uh, by what we search, of course. And the interesting thing here is uh, we're trending. Uh, female was single digits. So we, we are diversifying, that's really good news. Um, we also track the different uh, industries, EDA and IP. E we, we started out as an EDA site and uh, contrary to what some people might claim, we are the number one EDA site uh, in the world. We're number two IP though. Uh, 
design and reuse, number one. Uh, foundries, of course, we're probably the number one foundry uh, website because that's what we write about quite frequently, um, and services we also write about. Um, the interesting thing is we can, cross, we can look at cross-sections of this. Um, for example, FinFedSit versus FDSOI, we track technology as well. And so we actually started writing about FinFeds a year before FDSOI, I think it was 2012, 2013. And when we started writing about FinFeds, um, a lot of traffic. When we started writing about FDSOI, also a lot of traffic. It was really surprising, even though other people were criticizing us, saying, you know, FDSOI, not ready, not right, doesn't work, nobody, nobody cares. But we could actually see the traffic. And so we know who was reading this, right? And now we look at the companies that are publicly talking about their FDSOI designs two or three years later, those are the guys. But let me tell you, FDSOI is a big technology for a huge amount of markets. And we can see geographically where these people are. I would think Europe would be the hottest FDSOI design. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> China's trending, <laughs> so just to let you know. Um, we track companies as well. Uh, Arm is the number one IP company. TSMC, of course, is the number one foundry. I can't tell you who the number one EDA, is, EDA company is because they fight a lot, so it's better to stay out of that. But I'll tell you what, the number one EDA company on SemiWiki is not who you think. Just leave it at that. Market segments. This is something that I find the most interesting. We track different markets. Um, mobile, we started, and so mobile is, is big trending. As I said, IoT, we started uh, in 2014. Automotive in 15. Uh, artificial intelligence in 16. Um, we started doing this because we, I looked at the domains and I saw some interesting companies that were reading SemiWiki, and I was like, why is Tesla reading SemiWiki? You know, why is other companies reading SemiWiki. What's Google doing on SemiWiki? Oh my God, Facebook is all over SemiWiki. And so we can look at what they, what they read and, and you know, we knew uh, the Cupertino company was, was doing automotive stuff a couple years ago. Uh, we didn't believe it, but apparently they've announced that they are doing some automotive stuff. So hindsight, you know, we can see this type of thing. Uh, but one thing that you'll notice, and this is the direction of the industry, and, you know, this is a message to you folks, is um, artificial intelligence is trending now. It touches every one of these markets. And it's huge, because if you think about artificial intelligence, what's it going to do to your devices? Huge amount of silicon requirements, high performance, huge amount of memories. Um, boy, I tell you, uh, these companies are all over the artificial intelligence content we have. And I think that is the next big thing in semiconductors because it touches every one of these markets. Um, we write about events because it's interesting to see what's trending on events, which one of these technologies and stuff. And one of the benefits of writing for SemiWiki is we get invited to all the events. Sometimes they pay for our airline and our hotel. It's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, but it's good for us. And it's not just the events. It's the people we get to talk to. Based on the analytics that we all have, we can ask better questions. We don't have to say, are you designing FDSOI? We're going to say, how is your FDSOI? Pretty good? <laughs> you get different answers, right? So uh, uh, events are very important for us. You know, th this is a quote I've seen throughout my career. Um, semiconductor and electronic companies are still working at arm's length. You know, when I started and when a lot of you started, the systems companies were this, the electronic companies were the semiconductor companies, right? And so things changed, we went fabulous. But I saw this quote used last week at a conference in Mountain View, and I was a little bit horrified because I really don't believe this to be the case. Um, the second book we wrote uh, is a systems-based book, and it's why we wrote it, is we wanted to learn more about systems. It's a history of ARM. Uh, the first half is a detailed history, painful detailed history of ARM. Uh, my co-author is, a, is a, a diligent researcher, and he discovered things that even ARM didn't know. So when we sent them the draft, they said, are you sure? Are you sure? Well, we were sure. We also have a picture of Simon Seeger in this book when he first joined ARM. He had a little work done. It looks, it looks a lot different. Uh, but the second half of the book is um, profiling companies that used ARM. So Apple was the first one. And boy, I tell you, the research, I did it myself, the research on the Apple was so enlightening because I talked to some of the people that were involved in the first you know, iProducts, and it, it was just an amazing experience to see how Apple went from you know, a lovable computer company to a semiconductor powerhouse. And they really you know, uh, have a lot of influence on the semiconductor industry. The other chapter uh, is on Samsung. 
also an interesting company because they're a semiconductor company and a systems company, right? Uh, we also did a chapter on Qualcomm. I don't know if you know, but Qualcomm started out as a systems company and then they became a semiconductor company. And now if you look at their acquisitions and what they're doing now, they might be leaning more towards the system side. Uh, Intel is the same thing. You look at their acquisitions, they're doing system stuff. So, you know, the other message I have from the analytics from what I've seen and I've heard it elsewhere uh, in the conference is that um, fabulous systems companies are now, you know, dominant in semiconductors. Um, they're responsible for, I think Wally Ryan said, more than half of their revenues now, you know, the systems companies. Uh, so, here's some of the companies that, that I track personally. Um, these are companies that are doing semiconductors. Uh, they're doing a lot of edge devices. They're also doing cloud devices. Our next book is actually on IoT ASICs. It'll be out uh, at the uh, ARM TechCon uh, later this year. Uh, you know, as I said, these companies are doing edge devices that are more powerful than you might imagine. It, it's not going to be back to the dumb terminal days where all the compute power is in the cloud or in the back room. Uh, these devices we have are going to be very independent, and it's for a few reasons. For Apple says the customer experience, they want to control it, so they want to control all the chips and the operating system and everything else. Uh, but I think the compelling reason is security, because security is a much more important uh, cause. We track the security, the security traffic. It, it is a significant amount of traffic. Um, there's really only one way to control the security of your device, that's to control your silicon. Uh, one of the CEOs said this, they said, a, a systems company came to us and said, uh, uh, can you guarantee the security of this chip that we're going to use? And of course, the, the fabulous company said, no, we can't. And so that really is the reason why Apple and the other companies are taking full accountability for their silicon. And so we can see it by the traffic here. Uh, just one more slide, you know, in closing. Um, it's been an interesting experience working for the semiconductor industry, and I'm going to continue to do so. I, I don't have any retirement plans because it's such a fascinating time to be, to be involved in this business. Um, the other thing is I've met just hundreds and thousands of people uh, over the last few years traveling and writing and, and writing the books and such, and uh, our industry is filled with brilliant, brilliant people. It's just amazing, more so than any other industry I, I've come in contact with. Um, I'm not necessarily one of those brilliant people, but I am very curious, and that curiosity has served me well. So my, my advice to the crowd, to the brilliant people out there is, is be curious, because there's a lot more data available today than there ever has been, if you're curious enough to go and look. So we are going now to move to with a short presentation of Minalogic, brief one. Uh, so. so Minalogic is a digital cluster devoted to foster innovation for the ecosystem and also to try to accelerate the growth of our partners. Our membership is uh, 350 members, mostly SMEs, and we have launched uh, since uh, last 10 years nearly uh, 500 projects, which represent an overall cost of 2 uh, giga euro, with uh, one third sponsored by public money. So uh, with this bunch of technology, of course, we address a large uh, market segment healthcare, energy, transportation, uh, and so on. And now, uh, Minergic is lead this year uh, a Silicon Europe Alliance, where this alliance uh, regroup uh, 12 clusters active in, uh, in Europe, and we try to enhance uh, networking among Europe on this digital topic. So, as a summary, so we are a, a, digi a digital cluster for innovation. We are operating at the heart of the Europe Innovation Network and we offer specific services for startup, startup and SMEs. Uh, we try we, to push them to join innovation project and also we help us to grow their business. We also support large group. For instance, we organize 
uh, Open Innovation Day, where this large group can meet uh, startup with the new innovation, and also we support RTOs. So our ADA ecosystem is rich, uh, and for example, in the past two years, uh, US companies demonstrate a strong interest with uh, this cluster. Docero Power was bought by Intel, and InfiniScale ended exact by Silvaco. So it's, I think, uh, a proof of our uh, strong and strength. So to have a short overview, uh, our ecosystem is divided in three parts, a DIA tool with the CWS, IROX, Silvaco, Cialis, De facto, Azelta, Montor Cadence, and Magilem. We, are also, we have also members active on IP design, Dolphin, Manta, Scalings, which is a new startup, Intento, Evaderis, Tiempo, and Sign. And we have also the chance to have ATRIOs uh, active on this topic, TIMA, CMP, and of course, Serraletti. So to illustrate uh, this ADA membership, we have chosen five examples. The first one is Scalings, which is a recent startup active on IP and spe specialized on, uh, uh, let's say, analog design and mostly on uh, Sigma Delta uh, A to DC converter. We have a new one, a new startup also, Evaderis, which was launched by uh, Spintech Lab, and uh, this uh, IP design center is active on MRAM uh, technology. CWS is a well-installed SME, and they offer a, a simulator to enhance the characteristic of your design, especially uh, regarding the noise, and they optimize this feature. Cialis is a, an SME to enhance the manufacturing yield and they have a specific uh, offer to enhance your performances for this. And the last partner, uh, the Spintronic Lab, which is active on uh, uh, electrical simulator on uh, specific models. And they work also on uh, layout and in partnership with CMP, and they, active, uh, they are also active on um, uh, magnetic memory. So I would like to thank for attention, and uh, now I will leave the floor to Firas to a general presentation of Silvaco. Silvaco. Thank you. Just a time. Okay. Such I just did for smaller people. <laughs> okay. Yes, a little bit, say please. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. So, uh, it's so exciting to be at DAC each year. I'm doing that since really many years, and it's each time there's always interesting and important things that happen. And this year, I'm very happy to be here to participate to this event, um, mainly for two reasons, that I would like to talk to you about two things that I really love. The first thing is the French tech and the Grenoble ecosystem, that I really, I believe it's a really great ecosystem. The second one is Silvaco and the story. Since I joined Silvaco and the Silvaco project, and um, so these are the two main points I'd like to talk to you about, okay? So uh, I think that you know all about Silvaco. Silvaco is a global provider of EDA, TCAD, and also IP, okay, for the industry. Founded in 94, in 84, so it's really no historical provider, okay? 
Um, so I'll go in more details later uh, a little bit, I mean, quickly on the, what we are doing and what we like to do on the strategy. But just to mention that we are really, uh, you may know that we are leader on different domains. For example, as indicated here, okay. And Silvaco has a global worldwide presence. We have R&D centers, imported centers in different areas of the world, in US, Europe, UK, France, Russia, Austria. And also we have, for sure, business and support presence and also the other important um, areas of the world in Asia, for sure, in Europe and US. Okay. This slide, just to give you a very general overview of what we are doing. So if you look at this, if you look at on the applications and also the solutions. So I'll not go into the details, not really the, the objective here, just to, sh to let you see that we are really present on the main uh, needs of the market. Providing, so I repeat, TCAD, EDA, and IP. So we are up to date on the most advanced needs of the market, the applications, today automotive, IoT, and also mobile. So exactly with the same thing, EDA again, TCAD, and, um, and IP. What I wanted really to focus in my talk today is one of the key elements of Silvaco strategy, which is, I believe, very important to be able, sorry, okay. One of the yes, key element of the Silvaco strategy, which is innovation. I really do believe that this is a key element if you want to be up to date to answer the reply to the market needs, especially with the change that we are seeing on the market, on the evolution, okay. So innovation, we have two points internally, and ex we can talk about internal innovation, external innovation, and also the um, seeking and looking for the most important and that what we call qualified R&D uh, centers in the world. For this reason, I'll talk about also Silvaco France R&D Center. So uh, if you look at this Silvaco, we have so. US, this is the beginning, this is the founding, and then today in different areas, as I mentioned, okay? Let me, as that said, let me just give you some words on different activities. So TCAD, um, TCAD flow, Silvaco, we are a leader on the market. We are really, um, and we have a very beautiful and powerful flow. The innovation here is very strong. We are number two in general on the market in TCAD, but we are also number one on some domains like display. So here, the, the, you can imagine since, I mean, this is the historical activity and we are keeping the innovation and many knowledge how and the resources are dedicated to these solutions. So now to complete the flow, if we look at the TCAD and then, and then also modeling is Modeling is, is very important. This is really started, the company started with modeling, so to complete TCAD and we have modeling. And uh, now we added a new, a, a, new, a new capabilities, which is very, very interesting to complete the modeling solutions. And then you have uh, the SPICE flow, okay? So you have the uh, equivalent to the cl classical SPICE flow provided by measures. We have our SPICE flow. We are really an important uh, player on the market, and we are enhancing and strengthening this with the new uh, capabilities like managing the variations and also reliability analysis, RC reductions coming from acquisitions that I will last mention. I will mention in a few, the few uh, next slides. Okay. Uh, IP is very interesting. So um, this is in, uh, very recent to, to Silvaco. It's, it's coming from an, um, an acquisition mainly, but today it's, it's a division, complete division. We are doing an IP, we are commercialization, we are working and collaborating with the main actors on the market, and uh, this is the most uh, recognized actors. We, are, uh, we, mm, we have solutions to manage IP. This is very, very important, very interesting, and solutions to fingerprinting the, the IPs, I, okay? Anyway, we are uh, providing IPs and solutions to different sectors, uh, main sectors of the market. So um, 
Okay, now let, let me go to the, just to the story, to the next step, which is, a, uh, I, I would like to go to Silvaco France Center and coming from uh, the starting by this acquisition. So Silvaco's strategy, so mergers is really a key element on the growth element of the growth of the Silvaco. So in 2015, there was invariant started, this acquisition for reliability, and then InfiniScale and Edexact, Okay, and then uh, 2016 IP Extreme. There was two new acquisitions have been announced, but my slide was done just before ADAC. Um, okay, so you understood that. Infinity Exact are uh, two uh, companies coming from France, and so acquired by Silvaco, and this was the, uh, this was really the kernel of the new Silvaco France established and with these two acquisitions. Okay, and um, the, what is interesting really just to mention here that the Silvaco has decided to create this important business and a, an excellent R&D center in Grenoble in France. And this really, I believe, is not coming just because only of this education, but also to recognize the, the high level and the excellence of the R&D in, in the France and also of the global ec ecosystem that exists on France today. And I will finish my talk with this slide. Uh, I'm sure that I did not mention all the elements and, uh, of the ecosystem, but mainly ecosystem when you are saying, saying that, I'm, I, I would like to talk about the industry, the R&D, and also the other parts of the ecosystem that are very important. So today, if you are here, because we have Minalogic has organized that, and just here you could just uh, um, presented you Minalogic and the activity. We have the most important uh, industrial like ST Micro, Schneider, and other partners. And also LITI, which is very important, Center R&D, uh, excellence. And we have the ADA ecosystem present. And Silvaco became really one important um, element of this ecosystem with the creating of Silvaco France. We have many, many other uh, R&D uh, laboratories and also as our partners of the ecosystem for funding, for servicing, and for helping all this ecosystem to be really for this degree of excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Firas. So now the floor is for Thierry. Thank you, Eric. It's okay for the micro? Okay. So it's a pleasure for me to make the, this presentation this afternoon. And uh, of course, we at Leti, we work uh, in a lot of advanced technology. We may have uh, speak about the 3D integrations, the new memory, the photonics, etc., etc. But uh, tonight, I will make a presentation, especially on the FDSY technology. Um, because we do a lot of things since a uh, lot of you on this topic, on this domain, and uh, we will explain you what we are doing on this domain. Uh, okay, concerning the uh, industrial uh, um, actor on the domain of, uh, of SOE technology, you have, of course, SOE Tech, which is a startup uh, coming from uh, CELAT. Uh, you have uh, ST Microelectronic and Global Foundry. And uh, have in mind that we have a strong cooperation between uh, SOE Tech and ST, of course, since the beginning. And uh, together we push these technologies. The pattern belongs to LETI concerning the uh, FDSOI SOI technology. And uh, we do a lot of, we did, uh, and we continue to, to do a lot of things on the technology. And we made a lot of design around this technology with ST. And uh, now we have a strong cooperation with uh, Global Foundry too, because uh, we are working on the node 22 nanometers and 12 nanometers, uh, because uh, we want to give to Global Foundry new IP, new capability, new design flow in order to be able to have the right design for the future applications. Okay, so a few words about what we did around the, uh, in first around this technology. Uh, you have, 
you, you have a processing port, uh, and we put a lot of uh, yeah, sensor inside this port. Uh, we are able to monitor the frequencies, the temperature, the process, uh, and uh, taking into account this kind of information, we in the, uh, and we integrate some um, computer science inside the components. We are able to 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 make some act to to act on the components on the uh, uh, of the uh, um, voltage regulator, frequency frequency uh, generator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And due to this, taking into account that we we are able to manage this kind of technology, this kind of, on, uh, of IP we are able to use the body bias polarization of the transistor. And this is very important for this uh, technology. And uh, uh, due to this, we are able to, okay, to choose the right, uh, the, the right uh, voltage and the right frequency in order to have the right uh, 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 system, oper uh, the right operating for the system. And uh, due to this, uh, we add some uh, characteristic inside the, uh, characteristic of the um, uh, of the design kit in order to be able to take into account the um, the, the body bias polarization. So due to this, we are able to propose uh, ultra wide voltage range. I will I will have a, a slide on this topic, and we are working on the new design flow. And when you work on when we work on new technology, we need to be able to have the new design flow, and we need to have partnership with EDA vendor to increase their own design flow to take into account this new technology. Okay, so we published this uh, paper uh, three years ago, and uh, we demonstrate due to the, uh, these capabilities with new IP, we are able to scale the voltage from uh, open four volt to one volt, and to have very good performance in terms of frequency function uh, frequency inside the component. So this is a very good demonstrator of what we can do on uh, such uh, technology concerning the capability to go from this frequency to this frequency. And of course, we manage uh, voltage and the power consumption of the component. This is very important, and we did this, this job. And due to this, we are able to to make uh, to have the right uh, uh, frequency and the right uh, uh, solutions for the applications, and uh, for the new application like the IoT application, automotive application, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are able to have a high performance, load power, and we are able to put dynamicity inside the component. So this is very important, and we need to have. Tool. We did that manually, but now we are working with with uh, EDA partner in order to include this inside the flow to be able to make this automatically. This is a great challenge for the FDSOI technology. Okay, I will not g give you all the details, but we are very great expertise in RF SI uh, technology because uh, this is very important for the 5G. Um, um, components and the, this kind of technology will replace the, the other technology which are more uh, costly. So we are working on this technology. I will not give these details, but we are able to, to, to design very high level components in RFSOI technology. And we made a lot of uh, uh, improvement and we have a lot of uh, design run and we made a lot of uh, activities around this uh, very impressive technology. Uh, okay, we, we, have, we, we can have a multi-mode, multi-band power amplifier, so we are working in this technology and if you want to have some, uh, um, if you want to use this technology, so contact us and we can help you to go in these directions. Okay, so uh, concerning the FDSOIs, uh, Okay, this is very good technology in terms of reliability. And uh, uh, of course, it's important for uh, satellites and avionics applications, but for automotive applications, this is a very, very good node. And uh, this is very important to have solutions, uh, especially European solutions, able to, 
to process and to have designed for the next generation of automotive. And when we speak about um, automatic car, you, we need to have a very reliable solutions in terms of technology. And FD SOI, the Global Foundry published paper on this topic, the, the performance is very good compared to the FinFent and the bulk technology. So have this in mind, and this is very important uh, for us. And as I, I used to say that in the past, we made design for the, for the space optimizations. After that, we made design for the power consumption optimizations. After that, we made design for the thermal optimizations. The next step will be to make the design for the reliability and dependability of the system. So this is for us the next step and we are working on this in this direction. Okay, and uh, of course at Leti, we add and we continue to have cooperations with, uh, with EDA partner. You know, this is very important for us because we need to be able to have the right EDA tools for the next generation of technology. So we continue to work on these directions. The technology is one topic, the, the, the design in another topic, but the design flow is very important. It's why we have this, all these cooperations with our EDA partner. Okay, and uh, just to have a picture of uh, the design we did last year, it's, um, um, 50 design and uh, as you know we, we have a lot of design in uh, 28 nanometers in FDSOI and uh, we uh, plan to have a new design for this year uh, especially uh, sorry especially on the um, uh, FDSOI technology with global foundry up to now it's last year it was on a uh, ST microelectronic but this year we will have design on uh, global foundry technology Okay, uh, we have another activities concerning the 3D integration, so I will not give you the details, but of course we use this technology in order to be able to make the 3D integrations too. And uh, in order to help company to, to use this technology, we launched uh, three years ago Silicon Impulse, which is a capability which is a help for the company to go from the ID to the silicon. So we have, uh, okay, the industrial partner who want to make the silicon. With silicon impulse, we help them to go to the silicon solutions. And uh, in the first time, there is some uh, uh, consulting because uh, the people, to the, uh, the company two years ago, don't know very well this, this uh, technology. So we help them to make comparison. We made for, for them some design and uh, we have some prototyping, pre pre-production and one pup, and of course the production is done inside the, inside the foundry. So this is very important and in, we have this tool in the um, ecosystem of Grownables and this tool is managed by Leti. So if, if you have any questions concerning what will be the performance of FDSY technology of my, uh, on my de design, even if you, if you do that in a FinFET, contact us and we can help you to go in this direction if it is re relevant for you. Okay, so just a conclusion, like I said that um, uh, for us, the ADA partner is very important for the whole ecosystem, technology, design, and EDA tools. And uh, at Leti, we have the chance to, 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 to use in advance this uh, advanced technology. So we make in the first time the design with the hand, but after that, we have in mind that we, we have to work with the EDA partner to go to, from, the, from the manually solutions to automatic uh, solutions. So thank you very much. Again. <laughs> so thank you very much. I am presenting today in the company called Intento Design, it's an EDA supplier. Uh, it's true that we are based in Paris, uh, near the Louvre, but we have lots of support from Minalogic. So thank you very much. Uh, so actually we are developing uh, a tool, an EDA tool for accelerating analog design and migration at the simulation level, independent of the PDK and the device type. So I will, uh, I will present uh, the mission of Intento, then uh, I will uh, describe a little bit the technology behind the ID Explorer with a small example, and then I position uh, ID Explorer in the ecosystem. 
So our mission is just to develop uh, a responsive EDA tool that can really help the designer to accelerate uh, analog design and technology migration independent of the technology or the device type. So we can move from global foundry to TSMC, from FinFET to CMOS to SOI uh, uh, in a very seamless way. So uh, this is the first time that I present the history of uh, the company. So actually, I started as a professor in uh, Université Pierre Marie Curie in Paris in 2008. So I started to develop uh, this uh, methodology, and I put patents, uh, declared patents in 2012. And then I uh, developed the first proof of concept uh, through a transfer uh, technology transfer uh, company uh, that is uh, investing in uh, UPMC technology. And then I won a national competition for emerging startups. And in 2015, I developed this startup. I got a fund from private investors in, uh, in France. And I hired seven employees. And in 2016, we have put in September the, the, the software on the market. And we delivered this for the first customer. Uh, it was uh, another type of, another filial of SEA, uh, which are using it now. And we won a national, addition, a national competition also, and uh, an NNR competition. So we won lots of competitions, actually. <laughs> and now we are having lots of evaluation requests from India, France, Switzerland, Canada, and US. In 2017, I, I raised another fund. So we are 15 person now in the company, with more innovations to come in ID Explorer on different fields of analog design. And uh, we are trying to get more uh, evaluations. So the technology behind the uh, ID Explorer, I can describe it in this uh, diagram. So uh, what happens? What happened in the last 40 years in the market is that uh, we had this spy simulator, okay, and the designer uses it by specifying widths and uh, lengths, and then we came the the technology ADA guys came up with uh, with the search engine uh, and the capability of the simulator, so it gave the simulation based optimization. But this one didn't work well because they were giving uh, maybe uh, a space that was not really representing uh, the, the true design space, or to be honest, it was uh, representing the unfeasible space. But the designer did something else. He's doing, he's taking this vector and he's doing manual design using this vector. So we figured out that there is a step here in automation that was never automated before. So actually, Intento technology is just mapping these uh, intuitive parameters into this vector in a very fast way using constraint-driven design methodology. So we are capable of doing the whole flow very fast. So this is the flow, uh, if you compare the flow of uh, Intento design compared with the flow of Cadence, uh, the, the standard flow of uh, analog design, we have here schematic entry, test bench, uh, we have lots of iterations for manual design. It can take thousands of iterations here in our flow, we just start with the cadence, with the cadence constraint editor. We document the DC constraints. The idea of the tool is as long as we get quickly the DC constraints, we get all the performance uh, very fast, even the transient ones. So we just uh, supply the, our tool with the test bench and the DC constraints. We get sizes and biases, but we, here we, are, we call the simulator with a very weak number of calls. So instead of 1,000, we are in hundreds. And we can plug in this flow with PDKs. And then we get the size and biases quickly. But the particularity of this flow is that we can compare the, what is outcome from ADE Excel to what comes out of the tool. If these two are not, are not similar, it means that this design is not correct by construction. So I will just be more precise in, uh, so this is our, this is, we are the first company to, uh, to adopt the constraint editor of Cadence. It was mainly done for layout, uh, layout constraints. But we have configured it for sizing constraints also. So this is a band gap uh, on XFAB SOI technology. Uh, we, 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 t we choose the group of transistors we need to match, and we set up the device constraints here. Once we set up the device constraints here, the matching constraints, we can, have, uh, we can run the tool, and we, have, uh, we can specify, for example, we need to get the best 10 solutions f from the design space that we have set. So we, here we have uh, 10 solutions, but we have, uh, we, have, we have seen in this technology 
that none of them satisfies the constraints due to the weakness of the technology compared to this uh, band gap. So what we do is that we can select the solution and then we force it to do a local refinement step. So we force the constraints to be uh, satisfied. So we have here we have a satisfaction, a complete satisfaction of the constraints. We just choose this curve and do a back annotation into cadence. We have all the specs passing uh, in ADE uh, uh, Excel. If we compare these uh, values with these values, we have an exact match. If we don't have this, it means that the setup of the constraints was not correct. And here, uh, so we accelerate also the migration. So in this uh, step, in this uh, trial, we did the band gap. We migrated it from XFAB SOI into global foundries, uh, CMOS, standard CMOS. We did also the same flow, but we found that the global foundries suits more uh, this design. So the test, uh, the, the 10 solutions that uh, we got from global exploration, they were all met meeting the specs, actually. So this can be an indication uh, about the suitability of the technology with respect to a uh, topology. So here we just show that all of them are passed. So we ensure that the correct the design is correct by construction. So actually, the tool is not uh, is not bind by a specific methodology. We can use it for different uh, methodologies. We can do direct design methodology. We fix the node voltages and we just get the widths of each transistor. We can do it by applying a version level design methodology, or we do incremental design methodology or tolerance based methodology or what we call forward annotation. It depends on the designer, uh, it depends on his, his hypothesis. We are open with, uh, with all these kind of uh, methods. Uh, this is an example of uh, a, a design that we did with uh, a client in uh, Toulouse. He, will, he, want, he, would like, he wanted to actually to design his uh, proprietary cla class AB fully differential amplifier. It was 75 transistor on global found is one, 180 nanometer, but he couldn't meet the specs uh, required. So when he ran our tools, uh, he found two bugs in his design due to our incremental design methodology. The first one was oversizing. He was sizing a transistor 500 mic micron, and we got only 32 micron with our tools, so he was really suspicious. And the second one, he accused really our tools that it's not working well because there was a zero appearing in the in the simulation, but he found that this zero actually came from his test bench. So we, we did well in this uh, evaluation, and uh, he got the six, more than 60% of his uh, specs. So this is actually the combined technology of, uh, of uh, uh, ID Explorer um, on a single core uh, laptop. Uh, on a single processor, we got uh, for this 75 uh, transistor 30,000 seconds. But when we're combining all the technologies we have, we have developed, we get the same uh, optimal solution on, on 170 seconds only. So all these trials, we get the same optimal solutions. So we have really smashed the, the, the performance uh, 180 times faster on a standard laptop four cores. So we, we position uh, ID Explorer in the ecosystem. Uh, it's really uh, an intersection between design expertise, uh, circuit modeling, and post PDKs. Uh, we have lots of added values in terms of accelerated design, which have a direct impact on design time, cost, and time to market. Also for technology migration, we can uh, do it fast and really reduce costs. Uh, more, more important is that for design and migration management, uh, our flow actually allows the exchange of design between different teams in, in the same uh, corporate organization. We have lots of applications. Lots of benefits can be given for the foundries, for analog IP providers, design houses, analog IDM, and uh, SOC fabless houses. So finally, um, I can just say something about this uh, crown. It was designed by our, my office manager. She spent two years with us, with seven PhDs. So I had to patent this also in uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ami. So, uh, Mr. Chauvet for Magilem. Moi, ce qui est ma souris, allez. 
Sorry. Alert. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's good. So good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go through a quick presentation of uh, what we do at Magellan and give you a little bit uh, uh, more understanding of the company as well. So here's our mission statement. It's pretty broad as a mission statement. We are basically trying to help high-value-added semiconductor and embedded system leaders to substantially, uh, sustainably uh, leverage their business expertise. Uh, it's, it's pretty broad because we cover a lot of different technologies and uh, I'm going to try to explain a little bit what we do and how we achieve that. Um, industry challenges that we are identifying and seeing with our customers, well, competitive environment, they were trying to shorten development cycles, I mean it's pretty regular one that you will see it with every uh, companies. Uh, always integrate more and more content from multiple sources. This is something that we are trying to address specifically. Uh, deliver market breakthrough products uh, and need first time right process. Actually, we are trying to do, to help them in repeatable processes and not just achieve the first, uh, uh, first time right process. Um, we control R&D effort as well uh, and we are trying to address hardware and software. Um, in term of limiting factor, uh, the one that we see uh, Manual operations, it's a lack for automation, obviously. Um, inconsistent data, um, when you basically look at uh, a wide uh, product line with a wide range of different products, and you're creating design derivatives, you end up with a lot of information and making sure that all these data are consistent. So when you deliver your product, everything is aligned correctly is, is a challenge. Um, proprietary legacy database and flows, of obviously uh, trying to avoid having to use proprietary format and rely more on standards. Um, limited cross team synergy as well. Okay, so how do we address that? Well, we try to leverage the legacy of our customers, first of all, and we help them reuse whatever they have. So IP reuse is one of the key value we bring. Um, we help them automate design and uh, also, when we say design, we look at products, actually, and a, and a product is a combination of design and documentation. So documentation is also something that we uh, uh, provide solution for. Uh, once you have that in place, you create some kind of referential, so you can have uh, IPs that get distributed and shared with a clean referential, and you can uh, circle back to your legacy as well. All right, so... Um, these are the pain and what we call painkillers, the solution that we provide to our customers. Um, here you see a little bit the uh, uh, different products that we have in our uh, solutions. We have a main product line in design, so we have uh, EDA tools to help uh, capture front-end design, uh, uh, I mean it's a front-end design capture environment uh, for hardware and software along with a content uh, solution, which is basically what you would have to manage your technical documentations. Um, and we have combined these two solutions to uh, uh, help uh, the synchronization of documentation and design, along with driving uh, design from specification requirements. So this is very helpful to address some of the key issues like, oops, uh, let me go back. Uh, like enable interoperability and design reuse. That's uh, uh, a key requirement. We are trying to help multiple teams that are us usually distributed uh, across the world, not necessarily speaking the same language. So we address that through our uh, solution. Align all stakeholders with a collaborative exchange. Uh, it's accessing uh, design data, uh, like review cycles are very painful we make uh, the data, data uh, available to uh, every users. So uh, again, 
the way we address that is by uh, managing heterogeneous content. Uh, like I said, it's not just about design data, it's not just about RTL. A product is a wide range of different views, ranging from RTL, documentation, <coughs> software. Uh, these are things that we, we help with uh, uh, to automate processes. Uh, reuse, refit, repurpose, reverse engineering, also things that we help with. Um, so how does the XML based metadata description standard uh, help with the, all of that? Well, um, first of all, because it's an industry standard, it's an IEEE standard, uh, it's very uh, easy to share uh, information this way. Uh, you have an ecosystem attached to that. Uh, it's easy to integrate third-party IPs because everybody now is supporting IP exact. Um, the fact that it is uh, supporting both hardware and software, it's easier to keep them consistent with each other. Um, automation and uh, tools uh, can be built on top of this uh, machine-readable format. Um, we've seen uh, also um, uh, more interoperability between tools. We see a lot of a lot more tools supporting IP exact, um, so that helps as well. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, standard, well, it's undisputed standard. Uh, that's the only really standard available. Uh, for IP uh, reuse. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of uh, how do we relate to the standard? Well, we've been a driver of that standard from uh, day one. Uh, we've been working uh, with IP Exact for 10 years. So, we are recognized as a key leader in that. Um, I'm probably going to skip that. I already explained a little bit the uh, strategy around our tools and how the product lines works together. Uh, this is just a summary. Uh, the key value that we, we do here, how do we enable the content, the specification, the design, and the documentation to be uh, linked together is by creating uh, what we call a hub of links. We're creating links between different data, so when you uh, modify, let's say, your design, you can keep in sync your documentation, and if you modify the specification, you can also update your, your design and documentation. Um, probably not gonna spend too much time on that. This is again uh, talking about the uh, uh, hub of links. Um, why people do use us? It's because they wanna make sure that all the actors that are uh, working on the development of a product, whether they are um, hardware designer, architects, uh, verification engineer, uh, even people working on the documentation side, uh, they can collaborate and exchange data. Okay, and uh, managing a product, if you make a change somewhere, you wanna be able to propagate that everywhere. So that's what we're addressing here. And uh, the other thing that is important uh, with Magem, it's a non-disruptive technology, which means it does not require Unlike many people may think, it does not require to change your infrastructure. It's a thin layer because it's an XML-based format. It sits on top of your existing infrastructure. So this year we have introducing two new products. I mean, people use us to capture their design data. Now we have more and more people asking us, give us a way for external users to access this design data because it's important for them to review and, uh, um, and put in place some kind of review process using our tools. So we have created a design data analytics that is basically a web-based interface that gives access directly to the design data. We have also, we are very active also, sorry, very active in uh, virtual prototyping. Uh, so we have a solution now to uh, create virtual platforms for early software uh, simulation. So that completes, I would say, our portfolio of products, which is quite significant. Um, and the other product I did not mention is for architecture exploration. We see more and more people asking us to enter the flow as quickly as possible, as early as possible, and get the architects involved. Uh, this is our ecosystem. Uh, I think everybody confirmed that ecosystem are very important. It's true also for us, even the how broad is uh, the spectrum that we cover for the development. 
uh, it is key for us to have a strong ecosystem. Okay. Well, when you have a good ecosystem and a good tool, that translates in quite a few customers. So we are pretty successful. This is a list of our customers. Most of our uh, revenue is coming from outside France. Uh, most of our biggest customers are in the United States and Asia. And uh, yeah, we have customers in semiconductor as well as system houses. And uh, through our uh, content solution, we also have in the legal industry <laughs> and publishing industry. Okay. Uh, well, in order to help all these customers, we are a very global company. And we have uh, people pretty much everywhere. We have uh, offices in the United States, Japan, India, uh, China. We opened an office recently uh, in Asia. And also, we, we use distributor, obviously. That's it. So, Jean-Marc. For Mentor. Okay. So, thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I will not introduce Mentor. I may introduce Mentor as a, man, as a Siemens business, as you know, which was one of the acquisitions you put, <laughs> I didn't put in the Minalogic and a Minalogic member since uh, at least seven years. So actually, Mentor is, is rooted in Grenoble uh, for a very long time. Uh, this is the acquisition of uh, a French company, Anacad, in 1994, uh, which created the uh, circuit simulator Eldo. And probably now, um, I think by far, um, and I don't want to, <laughs> to offense my colleague <laughs> Firas, but uh, the largest uh, R&D, uh, local R&D uh, EDA uh, for uh, for this time and still growing, uh, which is uh, which is a good news. So, um, following uh, Thierry presentation, I will uh, give a brief overview of what does it take uh, to have efficient design flow uh, for FDSRI technologies. Uh, what are some of the challenges, and what does innovation that is fostered with the uh, Grenoble ecosystem and the Minalogic uh, umbrella? Uh, is providing to this uh, to these innovation capabilities. So uh, the FD SOI uh, flow is um, everything from digital verification to analog and mixial verification to physical verification. I will here only focus on the uh, printer. No, ah, I made a mistake with my. Okay. Uh, par contre, you're parti en mode. Uh, So uh, FDSOI and, and circuit simulation specifically, uh, one of the value proposition of FDSOI compared to FinFET for this full flow is that it was, uh, the value proposal of the technology was clear. And in terms of integrating this in design flow, that was a minimal disruption. Because the, uh, the transistor model was derived from, from the PSP model, so which is very well known and integrated in uh, all the uh, circuit simulator. The, the work that we have been, uh, been doing is uh, actually provide a full flow from circuit simulation, both analog and mixing all and RF, as well as uh, qualifying uh, PDK on this technology and uh, developing uh, cell characterization solutions. A little bit of history. I think we were the, the first, uh, the first uh, ADA provider to integrate the first UTSY model, still in development between uh, CLAT and uh, NST at that time in 2011. And since then, it has been uh, updated several times with more and more physical effects and, and to keep up also with the uh, growing demand of uh, FDSY for many type of applications. Uh, I think something important to notice about this model, if you are familiar with the, the rules and, and, uh, and the very solid and uh, lengthy process of the compact modeling consign under the SI2 umbrella, this was much faster. I mean, no voting procedure, no beta, nothing. That was a quick, uh, quick loop 
from the model definition and, and the R&D in Leti uh, to integration in, uh, in circuit simulator and specifically uh, mentor circuit simulator. So we have Eldo, which is still developed in, uh, in Grenoble for a long time, and uh, AFS uh, after the acquisition of uh, Berkeley Design Automation uh, four years ago, and which also supported this model very quickly. So quick overview of, of LDO, it's a LDO platform, so it's a complete analog and mixed signal circuit simulation platform. We are in circuit simulation, so the name of the game is always speed, capacity, multi-core scalability, throughput. Uh, there are things that you cannot do, uh, so a lot of customer success. So uh, some things are infeasible uh, without that kind of, um, of simulation and, and capabilities. One is uh, the analog defect coverage. Uh, we spoke a little bit about automotive. Uh, the uh, ISO 26262 standard is pervasive and all the semiconductor industry developing uh, ICs are more and more geared toward the, the strict uh, compliance with this process. Knowing what is your defect coverage and uh, in terms of the, uh, the evidence that you have to provide to uh, your customer is something that we do with DefectSim uh, and LDO. Full electrothermal capability is also something unique, which means that we solve the coupled electrical and thermal uh, equation. It's not just only uh, changing the thermal parameter, it's a complete transient electrothermal simulation. And in some cases, there are many, uh, many examples of if you just sweep the temperature and you don't take the dynamical effect of the, of the, uh, uh, of the chip, you are completely out of your specs and, and that, is, uh, that can be very business critical. So technology, uh, innovation and, and, and collaboration. Uh, we have a powerful ecosystem in, in Grenoble, like in many other areas. Uh, but I really mean it's some of the, uh, some of the three examples uh, that I will give as uh, the result of this collaboration and innovation are really based on uh, years of collaboration with uh, ST in Serialty in the Nano 2012 and Nano 2017 programs funded by the French government for the, the seven years now. Uh, also by the uh, IRT Nanoelec, uh, Mentor Graphics is a founding member and I've been doing a lot of research on uh, 3D IC and uh, uh, silicon photonics together with Leti and many other uh, EDA partners. And I really mean it because for us, uh, providing lead edge uh, FDSOI design flow means that we get access to leading edge test cases and design in order to create new technologies, improve the performance of the simulator, uh, and be very, uh, very efficient in, uh, in the, the full design flow. And also the quick turnaround loop is very critical. Yeah, it's good to do uh, innovation, but having the capability to deliver engineering analysis to your, uh, to your partners and put that very quickly in production, which is clearly uh, the, the initial goal of ST and mentor management, is something that is extremely beneficial. We don't do that only here in Grenoble, we do that worldwide with other customers and other simulators, uh, and other users of IFS or LO, but this is very important. Last but not least, uh, attracting talent, uh, and you know that this is a challenge. We, are, uh, we have been growing very, uh, very aggressively the R&D center in Grenoble. Uh, I have other teams worldwide in this, uh, in this uh, area. It's very difficult to uh, acquire. So circuit simulation specialist, it's, it's something which is in attrition. So we need to be attractive in terms of industry uh, in order to uh, fed the competition of much bigger software companies. And I think in EDA that was also um, outlined by, uh, by Daniel. We have unique challenges. Uh, I'm not born in EDA. When I came in circuit simulation, I was amazed by the, the, the breadth and the depth of competencies that you need to have in uh, semiconductor physics, uh, des electronic design, applied mathematics and computer science. Attracting talent is also a key uh, and having the international visibility is a key to, uh, to get uh, new talents and grow the team as we did in the past uh, seven years. I will take a few examples of, uh, of the results of this, um, of this collaboration. Circuit simulation, it's all about performance. So we have created in, 
uh, in Grenoble uh, a new uh, a new engine. So we not entering into the detail. We have Eldo Classic, Eldo Premier, and Eldo RF. Uh, we created uh, Eldo Premier six or uh, six or seven years ago, uh, and this is uh, the target was to be able to handle as fast as possible very large circuits with uh, by construction extremely good multi-core scalability uh, on very large designs. Uh, since then, we have developed several modes uh, in order to um, offer the capability to designers depending on the use cases of simulation from function verification down to sign off uh, to be able to use uh, the, right, uh, the right set. And it's not too bad in, uh, in one year. So as I said, access to circuits. So this is a result of uh, about 80 real production FDSOI circuits. And this is key. Um, innovation in circuit simulation is a lot about uh, electronic knowledge, but also applied mathematics and computer science. If you don't get, again, access to state-of-the-art circuit, you don't, you don't make it. So this is uh, the up to 6x in just, uh, just one year. I don't resist to show the, the slides of uh, ST, um, ST Italy, in, um, which is positioning uh, a new development and a new technology that we have um, for one year in uh, Eldo Premier, which is called Eldo Premier Functional Mode, meaning that the target is to perform uh, top-level spice verification within a spice platform. That is not a fast spice, still a spice platform with uh, spice accuracy. And uh, so with courtesy of my, uh, my colleagues from uh, ST Italy, actually this will be presented tomorrow if you're interested at the mentor, uh, at the mentor booth so you can still uh, register online. They will present uh, some advances with Eldo Premier functional mode that I will, I took some slide. And also a very, um, very outstanding work that the, they have done with uh, advanced variability features. So, uh, uh, that is not FDSY, this is BCD, but this is a collaboration with, with our colleagues from Italy. Uh, from from uh, very uh, relatively medium to uh, multi-million uh, size of, uh, of circuits, both in analog and mixing I think what is interesting to notice uh, is the acceleration ratio with this new technology is interesting, but it makes a big difference between days of simulation to one night of simulation. And for the design cycle, the design verification, and the throughput, that is really making a big difference. This is a big difference if you can launch uh, on top of that in parallel on farm of, uh, of computational farms, uh, night, uh, night simulation, and you get in the morning with, uh, with your results. So the same kind of acceleration for, uh, for mixing and simulation. And again, our uh, challenge and, and goal with this new functional mode was to extend the speed of a SPICE platform in order to intersect uh, fast SPICE technologies. That will never be a fast SPICE, but you get the SPICE accuracy with exactly the same uh, ease of use and uh, use model than the SPICE platform, but with much more speed. Uh, so I will go back to that. Just a uh, few words on, on variability. There are many, uh, many different variability uh, aspects in uh, FDSOI technology and, and others. Um, I don't have time to um, explain everything. Uh, we will focus here on the uh, rare events and, uh, and very low probabilities. And again, this is, uh, this is uh, a small ex excerpt from um, an ICCAD paper last year that we have done with ST and, uh, and a local lab in, uh, research lab in, uh, in Grenoble to estimate the, uh, the very rare event that it's very low probability in the range of 10 uh, minus 11 probability of, uh, <coughs> in order to estimate the yield of uh, SRAM based on the BIS cell. So this is true of for any kind of replicated structure. This is true for standard cells. And if you do a little bit of math, uh, you will see that you would need, uh, in order to catch that kind of, uh, of probability, 10 uh, to the power 13 Monte Carlo simulation. So it just doesn't, doesn't make it. Uh, so this slide shows show the, uh, the result. In fact, 
of course, the uh, ST people are, are designing SRAM for decades, so they had their, their own tools and, um, and um, Gaussian approximation, but we see that for very, very low, uh, so this is uh, the horizontal bars are the, uh, <coughs> the result of the approximation that they are making, and uh, this new technology that we have uh, in LDO is, uh, is the result. So there are order of magnitudes difference in errors, between uh, what was considered as, as a reasonable approximation uh, with real um, I sigma variability analysis that we have. Another challenge is uh, FDSOI platform characterization. So design platform, it's all about volume. Uh, volume, throughput, and uh, terabytes of data. Uh, so, so it's typical, and again, this is courtesy of um, Jean Arnaud Francois, in, who presented that at the UTU conference in uh, Silicon Valley in April. Uh, there are more than 10 case standard cells, more than two operating uh, PVT conditions. Uh, it consumes uh, probably, uh, yes, over five terabytes. Uh, terabytes. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. Uh, and again, this is the result of, uh, of a collaboration that, that we have with ST. They are using our uh, mentor uh, cell characterization solution for um, standard, cell, uh, standard cell and IOS. So it's an interesting uh, topic characterization because each of the simulations for standard cell is very, very fast. So we are talking about circuit simulation, spice models, automatic generation of stimuli, but also of typical computer science problem, that is fault tolerance and fault recovery. Uh, here we are talking about weeks of characterization platform for hundreds or thousands of, of cores. So it's not specific to ST, we see that at, at other Kronos customer. So it's a very interesting mix of pure computer science, fault tolerance, uh, database usage together with circuit simulation, and, uh, and now variability. So that's to do, uh, so we have two uh, Chronos analyzer, which is the uh, underlying uh, characterizing engine, which produces the, the Liberty models in, in various formats for timing, power, constraint, and, uh, and noise. And Liberty analyzer, which is comparing existing libraries if you want to retarget, if you want to shrink. Uh, the next challenge is, is this one. Uh, the Liberty tab introduced the, uh, which Liberty, uh, LVF means for Liberty Variance Format, uh, introduced um, the need to compute for on-chip variation models, that is to produce Liberty models, but also with uh, an estimation of the variability of the produced data. And, uh, and the industry has moved very quickly in the past three to six months towards an estimation at three sigma. So again, you are the numbers, weeks of simulations, just PVT without variability. If you add variability, if you do base Monte Carlo, you can have, uh, I would say, brutal Monte Carlo, you can have orders of magnitude. So we have been uh, using some of the technologies developed for actually analog IP variability to uh, use accelerated Monte Carlo techniques in order to match this requirement. So this is available in Kronos since last year, and it's an active, still active um, collaboration topic with ST and, uh, and others, in order to be able to keep up, because uh, also our customers are big customers, they cannot buy uh, tens of thousands of cores just for running a characterization campaign. So that is that in is interesting innovation, because uh, it's everything from computer science and the uh, distributed infrastructure, circuit simulation, advanced variability techniques, uh, very efficient usage of the underlying uh, number crunching, uh, number crunching engine, in this case, Eldo Classic, and also working on the methodology of the characterization. If you want to chase three sigma, there are things that you can do intelligently in order to get the same accuracy. Uh, without uh, with a reasonable throughput and a reasonable use of your compute resource. So these are only three, uh, three uh, examples of uh, this is ST conclusion. And both on the, on the variability topic for I sigma and rare events estimate and, and chronos and cell characterization with LVF, it's really the results of uh, multi-year collaboration. 
that we are leveraging uh, with uh, other customers worldwide and also with uh, other simulators that we have in, uh, in AMS and, and notably uh, and typically um, AFS. So, um, as a summary, I think this is, I fully concur with, with Firas. I mean, we are in a very competitive world, uh, both you as semiconductor companies and us as EDE provider and CA as technology leader. We really need this kind of close collaboration. Uh, when I do, uh, when I'm talking about uh, ecosystem, it's not just not violin and, and, and marketing stuff. It's real. Uh, collaboration in action, and this is where we drive uh, our design flows to be at the forefront uh, in terms of competitiveness and, uh, and innovation. Thank you. So uh, I would like to thank warmly all speakers today, and I invite you to network efficiently with a glass of wine. So thanks again. Thank